It could be a micro habit of downtime. It doesn't mean you have to say, okay, you know, no more homework or don't study for that exam. Like they might still need to do that, but how do you start to incorporate more breaks or more play? Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. Here we are getting to the end of May. It's about to be summer. I know we're all feeling like, oh, we just got to get through a few more weeks. If you have young kids like me, though, you may also be dreading, like, what do we do over the summer when school's out? Oh boy. I was just talking to someone today about how she's feeling really burnt out and she feels like she's got to wait for Christmas to get the kind of breaks she needs. And we were talking about how maybe it's just a holdover from when we were all in school. And this time of year, we started getting antsy for the end of the school year because we, you know, got the summer to just rest and recharge and kind of turn certain parts of our brain off. And we are still kind of conditioned into that rhythm, like, oh, summer, it's going to be easy and lovely. And unfortunately, I know that's not always the case, especially for adults who've got to work year round. But today's guest has something to say about this. It's Patricia Bannon, who is an expert on burnout. She is a nutritionist who I first learned about because she recently published a cookbook called From Burnout to Balance, which includes recipes, but also simple strategies for boosting mood, immunity, focus, and sleep. And she has a new project that is just being released this month that is all around wellness intelligence. I'm not going to tell you too much about that right now, and I'll let you listen to the interview. But I do want to say, I think this toolbox that she's got is so vital for all parents, all adults to introduce to young people. The messages are twisted in our society. The media makes it seem like, you know, you've got to go to one of these schools in order to be successful at all. In order to go to one of these schools, you have to do all of the things at the highest possible level. And, you know, sitting from where I'm sitting at the head of a college admissions advising organization, I can tell you that that is not only not true, it is also not healthy. And I think is really contributing to the challenges that we're seeing young people face right now in terms of mental health, stress levels, and burnout. So I invited Patricia to come and talk with me about how the work that she does relates to teenagers and what are some simple things that we can do to start staying aware of the kind of warning signs, but also helping people come back from a place where they're feeling burnt out. So take a listen. Hi, Patricia. Thank you so much for joining us. So great to be here. So I met you several months ago and you were on a panel talking about burnout in your recent book. And so I definitely want to talk about both of those topics. But before we go into that, I want to set the tone a little bit. The reason I was so excited to have you on the podcast was to talk about how the work you do around burnout and wellness, mostly with adults, is really relevant to our conversation about teenagers, especially with the increased academic pressure, you know, the craziness we're seeing about the college process, and of course, the increase in, in mental health challenges for, for young adults, especially young women. It, it does seem to start early and earlier for kids. And the fact of the matter is, whatever the parent is or is not doing, it seems to just be in the air, this feeling that you always have to do more. So I'm really interested in how we can apply what we've learned about wellness and what we've learned about burnout, specifically how to come back from it and how to avoid it, how we can introduce that to teenagers before it is inevitable and they have to learn that kind of thing. So, you know, I want to connect what you're doing with an adult population to the teenage context. And I also recognize that adults more than ever are feeling burnout and really high levels of stress. Maybe we want to start there. Is that just my perception or is that something that's really happening? Yes. Yeah, so, so happy to be here. It's such an important topic. I've experienced burnout firsthand. I know how alienating and debilitating it can be, but also some ways to not only get out of it, but what can we do day to day to not fall into the burnout trap? And that's so true for teenagers and kids too, because they're under more pressure than ever at younger and younger ages, both, you know, put on by themselves and the 
environment around them. So I think we can talk about burnout in terms of prevalence. 33% of women are currently saying that they're burnt out. I think it's slightly less for men. It's in the 20%, 23 or 28% of men are burnt out. And we can even talk about like, what is burnout in terms of the difference with stress? Because there is a difference. Yeah. Well, let's back up. So can you tell us about you and your story and how you got to where you are today? Yes. So I am a registered dietitian and I also love to do like healthy recipes and cooking. I've done this for over 20 years. I've combined it with media work. So I write for magazines. I do TV segments on healthy eating. But about 10 years ago, even with knowing all these wonderful wellness skills and information and sharing it with so many different people in different ways, I fell really hard into the burnout trap or symptoms and so forth. And it was you know, what the World Health Organization defines it in terms of work-related stress. But really, I mean, how do you even, it's so intertwined, right? Your personal life, your work life, and then also personality type. I find like being like very driven, I'm an A-type personality. So I'm going to be much more prone to burnout and not so apt to just let things go. And how do we define burnout? What was it like for you? If you can give us a real example. So for me, what was interesting was I didn't even know I was experiencing burnout until in a sense I came out the other end because you're just pushing, pushing, pushing. So what burnout is, it's a feeling of mental and physical exhaustion. It's when you start to disconnect from things that are meaningful to you, from your work or from even people or hobbies that are meaningful to you. And it's when you start to even just doubt your own self-worth or your own capabilities. And so for me, I just kept pushing through things. But then once everything seemed to be okay, I was trying to figure out some financial stresses and how to create a blended family and how to have a child in my 40s, which involved IVF, which can cause burnout all in, a, you know, in and of itself. And so finally, I was like, oh my goodness, everything's okay. This community I was so concerned about is thriving and I can't move. Like I am so depleted. And sometimes when your plate is clear and everything's okay and the people around you are okay, you're like, okay, what's next? And it was like, oh my gosh, I don't have energy for anything. I don't know what's meaningful to me anymore. And I am burnt out. It's almost like that feeling when you're just studying for an exam and you're pushing and pushing through and you make it through and then you're just checked out. You're utterly exhausted. And I felt like I had like 10 years of studying for a really hard exam and I was just burnt out. So since I had this knowledge, I started to figure out just how do I heal myself? How, you know, and it's really just getting back to basics, saying no to everything that's not absolutely important, simplifying your life, food, just back to basics simplifying that, setting strong boundaries. And then I also started to talk to women in my life about it. And I found out that almost everyone I talked to had their own experience. Either they were experiencing burnout or at some point in their life they had, and they hadn't really shared it because we're programmed just to push on through. Yeah, we are programmed to hide it, especially women. I think we feel the need to be strong all the time. You know, I I was talking to somebody a few months back. It was a mom who had a teenager with a ton of stuff going on in her life. And she kept saying how she had to be strong. At some point in the call, I was like, can I be honest with you? I think for women, strength is used against us. It's it's like a double-edged sword where obviously women are extremely strong. We do so much. We get through so much. And at the same time, the expectation that we will always be strong makes us sort of harden our hearts, not be vulnerable, not even connect to other people who share our experience or who could actually help us. So I want to be careful about that a little bit. What do you think? We applaud in our society that pushing through, Mm -hmm. even when you're burning the candle at both ends, like you can do it. You got this. I believe in you. And it was interesting when I interviewed some of the women for the book and the American mentality seemed to be just that. And as if, you know, saying no or not following through when you're just at your wit's end was a sign of weakness rather than self-love and self-preservation. But one of the women I interviewed from France said she got two different opinions because She's French. She was working in the U.S. She was in this burnout cycle, toxic 
corporate culture she was in. And she's just like every part of her being was falling apart. And her American friends said, I believe in you. You can do it. Push on through. You're in this amazing position. And her friends from France said, what the heck are you doing? Come home. This is not healthy. This is not worth it. Yeah. And I think parents who are listening probably see this happening to their kids. You know, I can't tell you the number of kids that are in this boom bust cycle, falling behind with their grades, missing assignments, and then they pull several all nighters and it's like a miracle. They're able to catch up and they're prepared for the exam. And then they have the exam and then they are so exhausted that they just crash and they fall behind again. And then the cycle repeats. And I know parents are really wavering between saying, you got this, we just got to push through to the end of the quarter. And hey, maybe it's not that important. Maybe your health is more important. Maybe your mental health is more important. Maybe it's okay to get a B. Maybe we take this B and we learn the lesson and then we, you know, find the, find a way to tackle this problem at its root. So talk to us about what happened when you kind of realized that you were burnt out and you started applying the learning learnings. How did you come back from that? You really, it's not going to heal itself. Like you really have to say, what do I need right now? How do I simplify my life from being burnout and deciding like after I wrote the book, what's next? Now I'm working on wellness intelligence and that has three pillars of health. And so this is one of the things, not only can you hopefully prevent falling into burnout, but also things that if you are burnout can help you heal. Mindset shift. Like you just said, maybe sometimes the B is okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to teach kids resilience and push on through and don't give up. I mean, there's valid times and places for that too. The line is not always clear, but I think just being aware of some of these dynamics can start to create a healthier dynamic. The second one is putting micro habits into place, wellness micro habits into place um, that can help you stay in a stronger place so you're not so prone to burnout. There's six pillars of that in the book in terms of mindfulness, nutrition, movement. I added one in working with you, Sheila. Oh my goodness. There were five. I talked about five and I recently added a sixth one, which is play. Oh wow. Because you did a value exercise in a women's circle that we're in together. And I was like, wow, I need more play. And I watched some TED Talks on it. And just in terms of, you know, not only is it important for our own well-being, but if your goal is really to be creative and productive, whether you're in a job or you're studying for an exam, it's so important for that as well. So whether the micro habit, depending on where you want to focus, sleep is also really important. And then the next one is community support. That is so key. And so for a teenager, you might see it that they are not sleeping as well. They're not eating as well. Mood-wise, they're irritable. They start to isolate. They don't care as much. And as I say these things, you might think, well, maybe they're just depressed. Maybe it's something else. But really, when it comes to burnout, the sign is that it's very much related to work overload yeah. or pressure overload related to performance. I mean, that's where you really know it's burnout and not something else going on. So related to that, can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between stress and burnout? Yeah. So stress, when you're really stressed, sometimes it's you are just pushing through. You're doing more. It's like that adrenaline rush. Burnout is when that stress has taken such a toll that you start to check out. You start to disconnect. You start to numb out. It's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. And hopefully listeners are not familiar with it. But, you know, I think about this and a a couple of students come to mind. I'm I'm not going to name any names, but I've definitely seen students who are completely disengaged. They're having trouble finding friends or meaningful activities. They don't even want to play video games. They're just, I don't want to do anything. Nothing is bringing them joy. There, There seems to be no motivation. And on the other side of this, I also see students who are disengaged but they are still doing all of the things. They're just doing them somewhat blindly or like robotically. They're going through the motions because they feel this is what's expected of them. And inside they feel so misaligned and disconnected, not even sure who they are. And I know there were definitely times in my life where that's how I've been operating, just like on autopilot. And I don't know who I am, but I am capable. So I'm going to do all of the things. I'm going to take care of people, work my job, whatever. Is that what we're talking about when we are talking about burnout? Yes. I mean, I didn't even know I was burnout till after the fact. So I was yeah. clearly doing exactly that. I was going through the motions. I was getting stuff done, yeah. but my inner joy <laughs> and who am I and what makes me feel good. I mean, that was just stripped down to just get it done. Yeah. But I have a 
stepson who's in college. He's a junior in college and he came into my life when he was eight. So I've also seen his trajectory in terms of applying for schools and getting really stressed out his freshman year, trying to get into the school of chemistry. And if he didn't get into the school of chemistry, his life would fall apart and nothing would pan out as it should. And it was like do or die. Mm-hmm. And um, he did get in, but I mean, if he didn't, his life would have been fine too. And so, you know, we see that too. You know, my instinct from a mentorship perspective is to model good habits for the young people in our life. And I love that the third pillar of wellness intelligence is community, because we can also model it for other people in our community, our friends, our family. Tell us more about the community aspect. How do you see it playing into wellness intelligence? Yeah. So in the program I created, it was a women's group, just that safe space to be vulnerable, to give people space to talk about their fears or that they might consider even like failures or confusion as well as celebrate them and help guide them. So that's so important for teenagers. It can be, if they need it, you know, professional help. It could be a tutor so things aren't so stressful. It can also be, again, like bringing back some downtime. That's really going to be important. Mm-hmm. It could be a micro habit of downtime. It doesn't mean you have to say, okay, you know, no more homework or don't study for that exam. Like they might still need to do that, but how do you start to incorporate more breaks or more play? So that could be joining an activity that's just for fun, yeah. not for, you know, applying to a school because it's going to look good, but just what is something or someone to hang out with or activity that's just for fun. Even if it's three or five minute little time spread throughout your day or throughout yeah. your week. Oh, that's so important. You know, it reminds me, there's a a student I'm working with and she's, you know, experienced a mixture of depression and stress and burnout, all of the things. And it's high school. So it's an emotional roller coaster. Anyway, I remember in some of our early meetings, I asked her when you were little, what were some of the things you did for fun? And she told me she used to just draw all the time. And so I asked her, how much are you drawing these days? And she was like, I don't have any time for that. That's not a priority for me. I don't draw at all. You know, she's an athlete. She's very studious. She's got lots of other responsibilities. She's involved in a lot of things and she just didn't see the value in making time for it. And as we have worked together, one of the things that I always encourage my students to do is community service, not just because colleges love to see it and it shows them, you know, how engaged you're going to be in, in that community, that college community, but it also is a great place for students to find personal growth and and discover interests and, you know, build a sense of who they are. I also think it's a place for play and it's a place where people can take things that they love doing and share them with other people. So, you know, with this student, I've been working with her for quite a while and we had this conversation a long time ago about how she really loved art and we were working on, well, what are you going to do for community service? We came up with a couple ideas. She came back to the the meeting and was like, I found what I'm going to do. And she was really excited about it. She's teaching art. She's going to be teaching art to young kids. And it just made me so happy that she found a way to reconnect with something that brings her a lot of joy and also is a great way to connect with a, a broader community and, and, you know, fulfill her high school's community services requirements. I love that. And I told you, I listened to one of your podcasts mm-hmm. this morning on a walk and um, it was about what to do in the summer mm-hmm. and how to choose things not that are going to look good on a resume, but are meaningful. Because as you're talking about them to even a school, it's like, what what did it bring you? What values did it show that you liked or hobbies or whatever it might be, or something you really wanted to learn about? And so you can actually use those opportunities. Like you just said, it's a wonderful opportunity rather to contribute to the burnout. Oh, I have to do this summer program that I might not want to do or might not align with to something that super aligns with you. And not only is it going to fuel you, I mean, when you just said that about she's teaching an art class, I could tell like you lit up probably because yeah. she lit up. Yeah. What are those things that light them up? And of course, it's not just for teenagers. I think if you step back, the reason we want young people getting involved in clubs and having hobbies and doing community service is because people who do that stuff go on to become really interesting adults who do that stuff. You know, we forget that. It feels like adult life is all about work and family responsibilities, but making it a priority for adults is such a great way, number one, to protect from burnout and increase wellness, but number two, to model this to everyone else. It's true. I mean, I think modeling is so huge in every aspect of parenting. Plus, 
when you're, you know, when your inner core is strong, yeah. when you have joy in your life and you're not stressed out all the time, life is better for you and everyone around you. I mean, there's that trickle effect. Right. So whether they adopt some of those behaviors or energies of like playfulness, even aside from that, just having a parent who's embracing that is going to create a more healthier, happier yeah. bubble for them to be in. And that in and of itself can reduce the burnout or stress that they're feeling. Oh, so true. And, you know, I have to be honest, I have lots of aspirations, you know, living a life that's full of all these wonderful things. But the reality is my life is mostly work and family responsibilities. So I'm still on my journey. What advice do you have for people who are like, oh, man, this all sounds really nice, but it's just not realistic for me. I don't have time. I'm the same way. You know, I know the importance of these things and I teach them and I do embrace them. But at the end of the day, like a lot of my day is work and getting through a to-do list, not usually mostly enjoyable. So that's why I love micro habits. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be what bring, what of those, you know, six now we added mm -hmm. play. Do you most want to work on, you know, what, what would excite you to have more of that in your life? And then what does that look like? And then can we start with one minute a day? Mm -hmm. What does one minute a day look like? And then build from there or five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And what I love about these habits too, is you start to incorporate them, whether you're a parent listening or it's for your child, you start to incorporate them in a way that feels effortless and not like the to-do list item. I like to say is it's effortless as brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. It could be even coupling it with something you do. So it could be you know, when I'm a dietitian, right? So sometimes it's like, if you want to take like, you know, a supplement or something, like put it next to the coffee, if you have a coffee every morning or whatever you're drinking in the morning, something that to remind you, my husband, I started with him. He wanted, he has some ailments from playing sports. And I said, what's, you know, one thing you could do that would change your life in terms of like wellness. He's like, oh, I would do like, you know, a 30 minute stretch every day. So can you do one minute? And so every morning he turns up the alarm before he does anything. He does a one minute stretch on the floor, which is now turned into three minute stretch, but it's just a great way to start the day. And he feels better. Yeah. It really helps. I mean, simple things like that. It's also like, you feel good. Like I'm doing something nice for myself. I'm right. realigning to my core. Well, Patricia, I feel like I could talk to you about this forever, but I think we're coming to the end of our time here. So what's one little piece of advice you want everyone to take away from today's conversation? Yeah, I'd say when it comes to burnout um, or even stress, stress is unlikely to turn into burnout when adequate support is available. Mm -hmm. And it can be support that you're giving yourself, like these micro habits you've already integrated, or it can just be like asking for help or with your teenager noticing that it's really gotten too far now. Mm -hmm. You know, we really need to realign because they're really starting to check out. And burnout isn't just, you know, you, the, the result is you're numbed out, you don't feel good, but it, affects every part of your body and your health and your sleep. And there's no way to live. I mean, life is meant to be lived, not survived, right? Let's all aim for that. Absolutely. Well, Patricia, thank you so much for joining us. If people want to learn more about you and what you do, where can they go? Yes. So for wellness intelligence, they can go to mywellnessintelligence.com. And my uh, website is patriciabannon.com, B-A-N-N-A-N.com. And yeah, on Instagram at Patricia Bannon. Fantastic. I'll make sure all of those are linked in the show notes. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, Sheila. Oh, I love talking to Patricia about this. As she mentioned, she and I are in a women's circle where we get to kind of work on these things every two weeks in community. And it is so liberating and uplifting and wonderful to just know that, you know, we're not the only ones going through this and other people may have figured some things out for themselves and they can share that knowledge or we could just commiserate together and have a nice friendship. So I hope that this was helpful. I hope you will check out Patricia's website. And if you're worried that your student is struggling with burnout, please help them get to the proper resources. I'm always happy to talk to anybody. And we've got some resources for academic burnout on our website that you can search up. All right, everybody. Thank you again for your time. We'll see you next time. Bye. I'm gonna go get some more.